I'm very excited to be here and honored to give the opening keynote for this year's Global DeFi Conference. Uh, usually I talk a lot about Ripple, I talk a lot about myself, but I'm here to talk about automated market maker-based decentralized exchanges and the future of DeFi, so I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to start by just zooming way out and just the digital landscape in decentralized finance grew from $670 million to $13 billion in the past year alone. This is a space that is just exploding. And key, right at the center of this massive growth, are decentralized exchanges, DEXs. They're the oxygen of DeFi. DEXs allow users to trade crypto on blockchains amongst themselves. Unlike centralized exchanges like Coinbase or Binance, they have public enforced rules for inherent fairness and openness. In 2021, Decentralized exchanges reported more than $1 trillion in trading volume, up from $115 billion the previous year. So that's $115 billion to $1 trillion in one year. That, that's just an, out, that's an outstanding growth rate. And the number of active decentralized exchanges has surged dramatically. It's also interesting to point out that the trading volume of assets is much, much higher than the market value. So when the market value was about 13 billion, the trading volume was around 1 trillion. And what that means is that this is a thriving ecosystem. This isn't just people holding on to assets until they need them and then getting rid of those assets because you know they didn't need them anymore. Or they were using them to pay for something. This is a thriving ecosystem of activity, of people who are moving things around, of people who are doing interesting and exciting things with these tokens. They're not just holding them and paying them. So what's a decentralized exchange and why are they so important? A decentralized exchange is a system for exchanging assets that isn't owned or controlled by any particular party. They can provide unprecedented transparency and fairness in asset exchange. If you've used centralized exchanges, you know that there's an onboarding process and they have a particular jurisdiction. They're in some jurisdiction and they can't, they're the jurisdictions that they can serve and jurisdictions that they can't serve. They're subject to regulatory changes, which can cause their behavior to be unpredictable. They've been known to freeze accounts because they saw something suspicious. They've had theft and reliability issues. Um, and, and this is not because they're bad at what they do. It's because they live in a world that's very complex and they're trying to do something, um, something new and difficult. Uh, decentralized exchanges don't have those particular weaknesses. They have their own weaknesses, but they don't have those weaknesses that centralized exchanges do. So how are the decentralized exchanges and DeFi connected? And what's the role for decentralized exchange innovation in fueling the market's growth? If you look at the landscape, decentralized exchanges are the most truly proven use case for DeFi or smart contracts. As I mentioned before, the market is huge. These are, these are being used to move real value. The driver seems to be providing liquidity between major tokens and between major and minor tokens. What do you want an exchange, a decentralized exchange for? Well, when you want to exchange something. And as the ecosystem grows, this long tail of minor tokens will be a significant driver of exchange activity. So if you see an explosion of tokens, major cryptocurrencies, minor cryptocurrencies, stable coins, tokens that represent equity, you know, tokenization of all different kinds of things, people will need to move between those assets. There'll be tokens that people want to hold, and there'll be tokens that people need at some particular time. And if those two types of tokens start drifting apart, then there'll be a, a, a need for a growing need for exchange. So people may want to hold stable coins because they're risk averse, or maybe they want to hold major cryptocurrencies because they believe that maximizes their upside. And maybe they'll need fuel tokens for various different projects and ecosystems. People will need to move between those tokens easily, or the whole ecosystem is going to become unusable. We're seeing lots of projects with their own tokens, an explosion of tokens on multiple blockchains, and that drives this need for interoperability. If you want to be able to interact with the, De the DeFi ecosystem as a sort of, as an entire space, I mean, think about the way you use the internet, right? You don't have to work very hard to move around the internet, right? It feels like a, a, so a place where you can sort of explore and you don't feel trapped in one particular part of it. If we want that experience, people are going to need to be able to perform transactions regardless of what assets they're holding. Decentralized exchange innovations like automated market maker protocols could play a key role in providing people that interoperability between assets. And automated market makers are poised to become a major cornerstone of global crypto liquidity across all assets and multiple chains. So what am I talking about? What is an automated market maker? What's a market maker? What does it mean to automate one? Well, in any trade, there's one party that offers the liquidity 
and one party that takes the liquidity. The party that offers the liquidity is called the maker. Party that takes the liquidity is called the taker. Market makers allow people to buy and sell an asset when they want by keeping the liquidity available. Automated market makers do this continuously without human intervention, always willing to trade whatever assets they handle. So if you want to buy something or sell something, let's say a stock, you would typically choose the timing and the direction. I want to buy five shares of Microsoft now. I want to sell 20 shares of Microsoft now. The market maker is always available to provide that the counterparty to that buy or sell, but they charge you a fee for that service. This is called a spread. And so what that means is that they'll buy at one price and sell at another price and profit from the difference. So they'll sell you an asset for slightly more than a sort of mid-market or fair price, and they'll buy an asset from you for slightly less than a mid-market or fair price. This allows them to protect themselves against risk um, because they have to hold the assets that they want to, uh, that they, so that they can sell them to you. And of course, after they buy an asset, they have to hold it. And so they take risk. Uh, and so they price in that risk in the spread that they charge you. Since an automated market maker can buy or sell an asset at any time, they have to have a pool of every asset that they're going to sell. Obviously, you can't sell something if you don't have it to sell. They borrow these pools from people willing to lend. So another interesting thing about automated market makers is they provide this sort of service for people who are willing to lend assets to the automated market maker to, perform, to provide these pools of assets that they can trade. And in most implementations, these loans provide a variable return. So it's a loan that behaves more like an investment. You give them an asset, let's say, you know, 5XRP, and you get some sort of claim against the automated market maker's pool that may change in value as that pool grows and shrinks. And obviously, the objective would be to get a positive return. From the point of view of those who lend money to the pool, who provide these assets, they get a diminished return if an asset goes up in value because the automated market maker will sell it too cheaply. But they get a very good return if the asset is volatile because they make a frac they make a portion of that spread that the market maker charges. And volatility drives transaction volume up. It, it's, it's an absolute truism that as the price of, let's say, Bitcoin moves, as it's volatile, you'll see an increase in people wanting to buy or sell Bitcoin. If it goes up, some people hit their profit targets. If it goes down, some people don't want to want to buy it or they want to reduce their risk of holding. And so you will see that volatility correlates with this volume. And of course, digital assets are remarkably volatile. Now, there's an interesting psychology or sort of practical analysis that you have to do here. Let's say I hold Bitcoin as a lottery ticket. I'm one of those people who thinks Bitcoin's going to be a million dollars by the end of the decade. I probably don't want to lend it to an automated market maker. Why? An automated market maker sells all the way up, right? As the price of Bitcoin goes up, the automated market maker is going to be selling it to the people who want to buy it. And it's going to make a profit on those sales. So it's going to sell for more because the price is going up. But it's not going to be holding till the end of the decade when I think Bitcoin's going to be worth a million dollars. So if I hold an asset as a lottery ticket, I probably don't want to lend it to an automated market maker. The trading fees that I get are not going to make up for the fact that the automated market maker sells all the way up. But if you think of an asset as volatile and generally trending upwards, it makes much more sense. If you sell on the, on, as Bitcoin goes up and buy as it goes down, you'll make a profit on sort of both sides of that and a loop will result in trading profits. And of course, if there's a loop in price, if I buy Bitcoin at $50,000, whatever it does, if it comes back to $50,000, I'm, I'm even, right? I haven't made a gain or loss in the cycle. Uh, but if I was trading all the way and making a profit on each trade, then I'm up. Uh, arbitrage is also a drain on pool revenue. So what arbitrage is, is people who find the pool overpricing or underpricing an asset. And of course, they buy from the automated market maker when it's selling at too low a price, and they sell to the automated market maker when it's buying at too high a price. Now, because an automated market maker is automated, it doesn't really know what the price is. A human market maker could check the price. And they could price, uh, they could they could never sell it below the fair price and never buy it above the fair price. But an automated market maker can't avoid doing that. Um, and people who trade against the automated market maker to make a profit when it misprices are called arbitragers. Um, that's important. That's important to understand because it results in a reduction in the returns that uh, that an automated market maker can get versus one that might um, have an external price feed. The XRP ledger has a built-in decentralized exchange, including all kinds of features like peer-to-peer -peer credit, sophisticated multi-hop payment features, and so on. And that leaves the XRP ledger uniquely positioned to leapfrog other DEXs by offering a unique automated market maker implementation. 
the probably the most unique feature is it allows those who provide liquidity for automated market makers to take a large share of the profits that would normally go to arbitrages. Can't really talk about the secret sauce just yet. Uh, we're not going to be able to get there alone. Um, Ripple can't Ripple can't do this by itself. Uh, we're working with the broader XRP Ledger community to expand the DeFi ecosystem with this automated market maker implementation. Um, Looking towards the future and looking at the current crypto landscape, crypto liquidity today is very fragmented. It's very similar to foreign exchange this way. Uh, we have an ecosystem with wallets, exchanges, blockchains, poor user experience, and poor interoperability. Uh, it's like the internet in those very, very early days. Uh, we need to get to the point where users can use these technologies without having to have these deep understandings of them. And given the decentralized nature of the underlying technology, that fragmentation is only going to increase. We're in a field with rapid innovation, constant introduction of new techniques and new systems. If they don't interoperate with existing systems, user experiences will be terrible. Um, we're also discovering a little bit of what some people call the bed bug effect. Um, what that means is that your grandparents knew how to deal with bed bugs because they were an experience. They were something that you know that was a real threat to them. Uh, bed bugs haven't been a big deal in most of the you know most of human society for some time, and so we've all forgotten how to protect ourselves against bed bugs because we haven't had to. The crypto landscape has discovered all of the scams, thefts, high yield investment scams, Ponzi's that sort of the traditional finance field has, um, and we're going to have to learn how to deal with bed bugs. Um, the crypto market infrastructure is replicating the tools and products we know from traditional finance on the good side as well. For, I mean, first there was spot, then futures, then options, loans. We see the same evolution happening um, in the crypto market infrastructure. It's kind of like the internet when uh, you expect things to emerge that you could not have even imagined in the beginning. Twitter would have seemed like and been a terrible idea in 1990. Ditto for YouTube. I mean, these are you know, and these are obviously big and popular now. What tends to happen with a new technology is we first use it to make existing things better, and then we look at doing totally unexpected and different things that weren't possible before. Obviously, like in 1990, no one thought about the the you know the internet delivering cat videos to people whenever they wanted them, but like that's something that we use the internet for. It makes sense today, and I think we're going to see the same thing. Payments being, I think, critical. Payments still suck. Payments are a trillion dollar problem. Things like automated market makers are an indicator of this sort of rapid evolution and just the beginning. I think we're going to see things like ubiquitous tokenization, tokenized securities, tokenized digital rights. Just it, it makes sense to represent ownership or right over something as a token. And if you're going to have tokens, you're going to need to be able to move between those tokens. If you're just stuck with one, you know, if you have a token and you're stuck with it, that's not, not very useful. So we need that kind of interoperability. As DeFi sees this massive growth, others in the industry have to understand and seek opportunities to continuously innovate. Those who don't seek innovations that make managing liquidity on these DEXs simpler and accessible are going to get left behind. Existing systems will face a constant threat of losing market share to technically superior newcomers. Standing still will be impossible. You don't want to be the MySpace of the DeFi ecosystem. Look at what's happened uh, in the internet space. As any technology matures, it has to attract users to grow. A key inflection point with any technology is when you don't need to be an expert in the technology anymore to use it. In the early days of cars, you had to be a mechanic. You had to change your own oil. In the early days of the internet, you had to edit DOS batch files with TCP IP parameters. These are huge obstacles to growth. If a person has to be deeply interested in an understanding of the technology to get the benefit, you're just not going, you're not going to see that mass market growth. The quality of the user experience is the most important thing. The user experience has to be fantastic. And I think uh, one example that shows that is NFTs. If you look at the first NFT projects that got real growth, their secret was a great user experience. You didn't have to be a crypto person. You didn't even have to know that there was a blockchain in there somewhere to get the to be able to buy NFTs, have them look at them and get that user experience. I can't overemphasize how important that is. So a lot of people don't know this, but the XRP ledger was the original decentralized exchange, fully functional since 2012 without incident. One of the first things that I realized with along with the other early XRP ledger developers back in 2011 and 2012 was that even if you thought, I mean, at the time, Bitcoin was the only blockchain and what everybody thought was uh, uh, maybe there was, you know, there were Bitcoin clones, but really what people were thinking was Bitcoin would take over the world. 
And one of the first things that we realize is even if you think Bitcoin is going to take over the world and everybody's going to use Bitcoin, it has to get, you have to get there somehow. There has to be some way to get from where the value is now to Bitcoin. Those bridges would have to exist, even if you were, you know, we didn't call them that at the time, but even if you were a Bitcoin maximalist who thinks Bitcoin is the key asset, Bitcoin has to interoperate with dollars because that's where people's value are, it has to interoperate with pounds and euros and all of those other, all of those other things. So what we realized very early is we wanted a multi-asset ledger. And if you're going to have a multi-asset ledger, if I'm going to hold dollars and someone wants to get paid Bitcoin and someone else has XRP, there has to be interoperability between these assets. And what we built is a decentralized exchange, payment, pathfinding, all of these sophisticated features, order books, to make a multi-asset payment just work. We demonstrated that in late 2012, early 2013, that you could log into an account on the XRP ledger and you could say, hey, I want to pay you know, Jeff one Bitcoin. It'll say, well, you can pay for that out of your XRP balance, your Ether balance, your dollar balance. Um, and that, that's just a, you know, that's a fantastic user experience where all of these tokens just work. The XRP Ledger DEX has grown and shrunk over the years, but I think it is held back a little bit today by three major issues. Uh, one big problem is that there's a lack of major and even significant minor tokens on the XRP Ledger. If, if XRP is the only interesting token, then you don't need a decentralized exchange, right? Where you need a decentralized exchange is where you have access to a number of interesting tokens. So if some people have XRP and some people have Bitcoin and some people have dollars, that's when there's a need for a decentralized exchange. And of course, there's no point in providing liquidity if there's nobody to take it, right? What we've been working on, along with other people in the XRP ecosystem, is uh, federated sidechains which is a way to bring in assets from other chains. This is, I think is very important. Uh, different blockchains are going to have different features. There are blockchains that are designed for payments, blockchains designed for smart contracts, blockchains designed for NFTs. And if they all have their own assets and you can't move assets between chains, that's going to become a very, very awkward and uninteresting uh, system to use. Federated sidechains will allow foreign tokens like Bitcoin to exist on the XRP ledger in a better way than the way they do today, rather than through gateways, through sort of decentralized bridges. Uh, the XRP ledger today does not have any support for automated market making. And I think all major DEXs have shown that that, that, that is a, a must have. The XRP ledger uses order books instead. These work and they work well. They just don't provide as much liquidity as automated market makers can. And I think another important point is Automated market makers allow stakeholders to get a return from the profits the automated market maker gets, and not having that is big. And the last issue goes back to awareness. I think a lot of people don't know the XRP ledger has a DEX or don't believe the XRP ledger is decentralized, and so they don't look at the feature set to see if it meets their needs. One thing I'll see is people will ask if the XRP ledger has smart contract functionality, and it, it doesn't. Uh, and they think DEXs and automated market makers can't exist without them. That's not true. The XRP ledger has fixed function transactors that can include that include the support for the decentralized exchange. So it's kind of somewhere between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin is fixed function, but the function set is very small. Ethereum is, you know, can do anything. XRP ledger is in the middle. It's fixed function, but the function set, the feature set is very large. As it happens, the XRP ledger has a number of design features that give its decks a huge competitive advantage, especially if combined with automated market making. These include not just low costs and high speeds, but also the pathfinding and payment engine that can draw on automated market makers as a liquidity source. The XRP ledger has higher transaction speed, lower transaction cost, and less transaction gameability than most other major blockchains. And these are very critical in the AMM DEX environment. Uh, consider a blockchain with a $1 fee. With a $1 fee, nobody can arbitrage until the trade can make them more than a dollar, because otherwise they'd take a loss on the fee. So arbitragers have to wait and leave the pool exposed until the imbalance exceeds the fee. Since arbitrage or gains are pool losses, that means the pool loses more than a dollar. But if you drop the fee to 10 cents, the arbitrager sends their transaction sooner because they don't want someone else to beat them to it. And the pool loses much less than a dollar. Speed matters too. If your transaction might not execute for three or four minutes, you have to build in a cushion to tolerate the way prices might change between when you form the transaction and when it executes. This similarly translates into a tax that hurts all participants. XRP ledger execution times are below 10 seconds. And lastly, the XRP ledger has no block producers, no miners or stakers who can reorder, remove, or front run your transactions. There's no MEV on the XRP ledger. And that's good for people who want to use the DEX because those costs come out of their pockets. 
Because of the XRP Ledger's inherent advantages as an AMM and DEX platform, Ripple's engineering team is designing an expansion to XRP Ledger's order book DEX to include an automated market maker, offer better user experience, and greater liquidity to this long tail of tokens. Liquidity providers will get better returns through the inherent execution advantages of the XRP Ledger that I just mentioned, and a sort of secret sauce that will allow liquidity providers to get more of the profits normally lost to arbitrage, and it will be bolstered by incentive programs. Traders will get better pricing and better order execution due to integration with existing order books. They won't have to change anything they do. You'll be able to e execute the same um, payment and trading transactions on the XRP ledger. You'll get more liquidity and better payment and trade execution. This is because the XRP ledger already supports cross-asset payments, and it supports cross-asset payments through multiple paths. So one of the problems with a cross-asset payment, let's say I'm spending XRP to pay somebody Bitcoin, is I'm going to draw down an order book or I'm going to push the market against me. I'm going to take the cheapest liquidity first, and then I'm going to have to move to more expensive liquidity. The XRP ledger has multi-path payments that can draw down liquidity from multiple sources, and that will include the auto various automated market makers. So for example, if I'm going from XRP to USD, I can also go from I can go directly from XRP to USD through an automated market maker order book. But I could also go XRP Bitcoin USD, XRP Ethereum USD through these multiple paths. And if I draw down multiple paths at the same time, I don't have to go, I don't have to move the market as much. And so I can get a better rate. Done right. Automated market makers on the XRP ledger could be a game changer, uniquely positioning it to leapfrog other DEXs. Key differentiators are that sort of native fixed function rather than smart contract based. While that doesn't have uh, that does have some disadvantages, it is faster, more efficient, more secure, and I think importantly more predictable. So if you think about Ethereum, where there's many DEXs, those DEXs can be very, very different because they're implemented by their own smart contracts, and those smart contracts allow them to do anything. But what that means is when you use a DEX on Ethereum, you don't really know what what its rules are unless you investigate that individual DEX. And what's going to happen is these decks, uh, you know, for example, it could have it could it could preference liquidity to some token that you've never heard of, or it could have execution rules that give preferences to particular people or, or something. It might not, but you don't you don't know. So the advantage of having the more limited feature set is that it's not possible for any for it to sort of have misfeatures that you don't like. Um, it's going to be more liquid because of liquidity aggregation across assets due to the pathfinding and multipath that I was talking about. The amazing thing is that the primary way to arbitrage or a trade will be through making a payment. So this is a weird thing to think about. Let's say there's an automated market maker that's going between XRP and USD, and you want to arbitrage against it. Um, you want to make it. You let's say it's selling USD, uh, it's selling XRP at too low a price, and you want to buy XRP from it. What you do is you just pay yourself XRP. That's it. You make a payment to yourself of XRP, and if the automated market maker provides the best rate, it'll use it automatically. And then there's the secret sauce I mentioned, reducing impermanent loss. This is novel in the automated market maker market. Much of the profits that arbitragers would have taken will wind up as additional revenue to the liquidity providers who loan assets to the pool. An automated market maker implementation would include not only XRP ledger protocol changes, but support in developer libraries, SDKs, middleware, and so on. Liquidity providers would need to use new methods to contribute liquidity, but everyone else will use it through the existing pathfinding payment and exchange mechanisms. Um, we're also partnering with the XRP Ledger on a number of native DeFi support solutions and developer tooling, uh, things like hooks, native EVM chain, and federated side chains to bring access to DeFi. So there's not going to be one token to rule them all. There will be major cryptocurrencies, minor cryptocurrencies, stable coins, application fuel tokens, tokenized securities, and who knows what else. And for that system to work, moving easily and fairly between the tokens you want to hold and the token you need right now is going to be at the core of the DeFi ecosystem. With that, I'll end by saying I believe the crypto market is favoring those exchanges with high innovation and high scalability. And innovations like the XRP Ledger Automated Market Maker are just an example of working to own a slice of that DeFi pie. And don't expect to see DEX or DeFi innovation slow down anytime too soon. Expect the opposite, in fact. I invite you all to explore Ripple's Automated Market Maker specification, which will be published to the wider XRP Ledger community shortly. Thank you. I think we have some time for a Q&A. Thank you, David. What an amazing talk. Uh, I especially like the bit when you were talking about MySpace. Um, I feel like we are going through a similar transition with DeFi right now. It did very much start as a developer-orientated um, space where it 
as a user mm -hmm. experience is uh, being picked up by a lot of companies, it's definitely way more accessible for people and you can see the transition, it's really interesting. Uh, we definitely have time for some questions. Um, this one's been voted for by Lisa Loud, who's also one of our hosts on this track too. She says, let's put it on stage. What DeFi protocols do you think will rise over the next year? You know, it's, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I'm so, I mean, obviously I'm going to have to, I'm going to have, um, it, it's an, it's, <laughs> it's really hard to pick out winners and losers. I hate to sort of try to make predictions of what's going to happen because the space is so dynamic. Um, there's just so much innovation going on that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sort of, uh, I, I will say, though, that scalability and the user experience is what's going to drive the ones that rise. Uh, scalability is important because when you start rationing based on fee, what happens? So this is this is an interesting point. So sometimes people think that when you ration based on fee, that's a good thing. And it makes that ecosystem sort of grow. like people look at Ethereum fees going up and say, that's great. It's popular. It's, it's popular. But what that means is that it's unpredictable and it's sort of availability. And I think that's going to drive people away. So scalability is going to be important to sort of hold fees down. So I think it's going to be the ones that can provide reliability and great user experiences. And probably many of them will be ones that don't even exist right now because the space is that dynamic. But I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try the crystal ball thing. <laughs> I, think, I think that that would be wise. And then um, another one from Lisa was, "What is the difference between federated sidechains and wrapped tokens?" So, uh, good, good question. So, wrapped tokens are something that can be provided by federated sidechains, but that's not the. That's sort of not the only thing that federated sidechains can do. So, they're they're very orthogonal concepts. So, a wrapped token is a token on one blockchain that's not native to that blockchain. So if you have Bitcoin on the XRP ledger, it's not Bitcoin is not native to the XRP ledger. It's a, it's a wrapped, it's a foreign token. And the idea is that it should behave as much like the native token as possible. Federated sidechains allow you to have multiple sidechains with wrapped tokens on them, such that those sidechains can interoperate. So I can make a payment from one sidechain to another to provide that sort of seamless use of wrapped tokens. So sort of the, so sort of their complementary technologies. Federated sidechains can provide horizontal scalability because they have their own transaction rate. It can provide different transactors. But wrapped tokens are what allow you to access the tokens that you know and love. So let's say you you like DeFi, but you also like XRP. The XRP ledger doesn't have much very doesn't have DeFi components beyond the fixed function DEX AMM type functions. So um, wrap tokens and federated sidechains together would allow you to access the tokens you want on the sidechains that have the features you want. Amazing. Thank you for that. And then last one. Well, yeah, we can go over a little bit. What are the long-term goals for Ripple? I think the biggest one is to make payments, particularly cross-border payments, feel like email. Email is everything that, that payments are not. And the funny thing is, like, it seems like that's a huge job, and it definitely is. But there's sort of in there's sort of points at which you can apply an enormous amount of leverage. Like, one interesting thing is one of the things that email has is a universal namespace. I can ask you your email address, and then everything works from there. We don't have a universal payment address, so just like those kinds of things, uh, uh, although that wouldn't do everything, that wouldn't mean that I could pay you easily. It would it would end this thing of like, do you have Zelle? No, I don't think so. Oh, what, you know, what bank? Well, never mind. Let's see. Do you have PayPal? Do you have this? No, you don't. Do you have this? Oh, can you accept Bitcoin? Oh, I think so. I think, you know, I have my broker accepts Bitcoin. Uh, well, can, what's your receiving address? Oh, let me figure out, try to figure out how to, right? It saves the human negotiation. We could replace that with automated negotiation with just a payment address. So the pay, making the payment experience better, I think, is critical. And then I think also just providing tools and support to the to the to the ecosystem to allow it to develop. The way I think about Ripple is like our target market doesn't exist. Our target market are people who have these tools that are integrated, that have interoperability, that give them the seamless user experience, just like Twitter. Twitter's target market is people who like have home internet access, right? And people who have smartphones. They're not trying to get people smartphones. They're not trying to get people home internet access. They start where we need to get. Like we need to get to the point where our target market exists, right? Like, like if you had the idea for Twitter in the 90s, your target market doesn't exist, so you can't do anything with it. The long-term goal is to get that target market to exist so that we have a market for the products and services that we re sort of really want to be offering the world. It's a strange place to be. The nice thing about that is we need our competitors to succeed, right? Like if you're Twitter, it's you, it's 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 the MySpaces of the world and the GeoCities of the world that made people have home internet access, that made them have smartphones. So we're actually in a in a point where we we need to be benevolent 
because we we it could just like no company could build the internet all by itself. They couldn't do smartphones and ISPs and Twitter and right. No company could do all of that. So you need an ecosystem to exist. And so it's nice that we're in a position where benevolence like is too is is a, is in our self interest. It's kind of ironic. So we want to grow the whole. We want our competitors to succeed perversely. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't agree more. Well, David, that's all we have time for, unfortunately. But thank you so much for joining us today. And everybody else watching, thank you for all your input, all your emojis. Uh, and head over to the Emergence of Tools, which Lisa Lau will be moderating. But David, thank you again. So great. Thank to you, Selena. It was a pleasure to be here.